Welcome to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio with author, speaker, and your host, Pat Rulo. Finally, someone willing and able to blow the top off hidden healthcare and hospital dangers. She's provocative, upbeat, balanced, fearless, fresh. Pat has over 20 years of experience as a professional public speaker and knows how to approach this important subject with enough humor and wit to keep you informed, entertained, and empowered. Each week you will say, oh, as Pat explores and exposes little-known hospital hazards, delves into the deep waters of dangerous healthcare practices, picks the brains of her good-looking and influential guests to help keep you and your family safe in today's fragmented healthcare system. The program is not intended to replace medical advice from a licensed professional, but rather to encourage you to become a well-informed participant in your health and well-being. And now, your host, Pat Rulo. Hello, I'm Pat Rulo, hostess of everyone's favorite patient safety radio program, Speak Up and Stay Alive. And once again, I'm just so happy to be here with you to share some critical patient safety tips and tools. And today, I have an infection update, a teenage patient activist as our guest, and a fun game of Jeopardy ready to roll. So, you know the drill. First, grab a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. You just might want to take notes. Then sit back in your best radio seat, turn off that darn cell phone, and enjoy this next hour with me. I'm glad you're here. And now it's time for the healthcare hazard of the week. C. diff. In 2013, the Centers for Disease Control declared C. diff an urgent public health threat, placing it first on the list of critical dangers to Americans. But many reports of C. diff focus on adults and seniors in long-term care settings, leading to ignorance of its risks to younger patients. So what is C. diff and what are the symptoms? C. diff are bacteria that produce toxins that damage the lining of the gut. And it's the letter C, D-I-F-F, stands for Clostridium difficile. Common symptoms of a mild infection include watery diarrhea two or more times a day for two or more days, and mild abdominal cramping and tenderness. In severe cases, the bug can lead to inflammation of the colon, resulting in fever, nausea, dehydration, loss of appetite, and substantial weight loss, and in some cases, even death. Just recently, the Centers for Disease Control released a stunning report on the number of children affected with C. diff infections each year. From their press release, they say, according to preliminary CDC data, An estimated 17,000 children aged 1 through 17 get C. diff infections every year. The pediatric study found that there was no difference in the incidence of C. diff infection among boys and girls, and that the highest numbers were seen in white children and those between the ages of 12 and 23 months. The typical person with C. diff is thought of as being older, taking antibiotics, and in the hospital. For the first time, the most striking observation is that three-quarters of cases in children are being contracted in the community, not in the hospital, and that's huge compared to the past. The research published in the medical journal Pediatrics noted the following regarding C. diff infections in children. 71% of the cases of C. diff infection identified among children aged 1 through 17 years were community-associated, and that means that the child acquired the infection outside of the hospital. 73% were prescribed antibiotics during the 12 weeks prior to their illness, usually in an outpatient setting such as a doctor's office. Most of the children who received antibiotics were being treated for ear, sinus, or upper respiratory infections. And the CDC report makes it clear that C. diff poses a particular challenge for infants between the ages of 12 and 24 months, just as many are beginning to walk. Now, if you've listened to this program before, or if you've attended any of my presentations, you know that I warn against the indiscriminate use of antibiotics. And I hate to say this, but many times, parents are the initiators of this rampant overuse of antibiotics. Let's say little Jimmy has an earache. He's crying and tugging at his ear. 
The parent takes him to the doctor and demands some relief. Can't you give little Jimmy something to stop this terrible crying? The doctor peers into Jimmy's ear and writes a prescription for an antibiotic. Hmm, here's something the parent does not ask, but should. Is it really a bacterial infection? How do you know that? Because antibiotics do nothing to relieve a virus, an allergy, or a crabby, whiny child. But the parent wants to feel that something is being done, and the rush doctor wants to satisfy his client, and off we go. Now, of course, little Jimmy will not fall over dead after taking a course of these antibiotics, and that is one reason why they are so dangerous. You don't feel any negative results, so all must be good. But it's the cumulative lifetime effects that linger. Remember the word origin. Anti is a prefix that means against. Bios is from the Greek word that means life. Therefore, an antibiotic is against life, good and bad. It's not smart enough to know the difference, unless, of course, it's a relative of the smartphone, the smart meter, and is considered a smart antibiotic. Sorry. Well, antibiotics kill everything inside the gut, and when good bacteria that protects against infection is wiped out by antibiotic treatment, well, it's easy to see how this works. A key way for us to begin to reverse the striking number of infections in children is more prudent use of antibiotics, because antibiotic exposure is a key risk factor for C. diff. So what should parents do to keep their children safe from C. diff? First and foremost, don't demand antibiotics if your doctor says your child doesn't need them. Nearly 50% of antibiotics are inappropriately prescribed, according to Jan E. Patterson, MD, President of the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Second, as parents or even grandparents, if your child has symptoms that you plainly see are severe and out of the ordinary, if your child comes down with persistent diarrhea, you may want to consult a doctor to make sure it's not C. diff. And remember today's program, it might be signs of a C. diff infection, especially if your child has recently taken an antibiotic. And in the presence of such symptoms, especially when initial treatments don't work, ask about a stool test. In a hospital setting, studies prove that pathogens such as C. diff and MRSA can persist on environmental services for months at a time and can be found facility-wide in non-isolation rooms. Combine that with studies that indicate that only 50% of environmental surfaces in a typical hospital operating room or a patient room may be effectively disinfected, and these surfaces can enable transmission of dangerous pathogens. These high-touch surfaces that may have been missed during routine cleaning include bed rails, doorknobs and handles, as well as areas that may be difficult to clean manually and thoroughly such as walls, light fixtures, windows, floors, privacy curtains, and everyone's favorite, the TV remote. I always suggest that before you or a loved one pops into a hospital bed, put on some gloves, grab the bleach wipes that most hospitals offer next to the sink, and wipe down the room, one surface at a time, one wipe per swipe. And if you bring a child to visit someone in a hospital or a nursing home, remember, this is the home for infectious bacteria, and kids just love to run around and touch everything, seldom washing hands, and then touching their face and mouth. Actually, the same warning goes for doctor's offices, really any public place. This bacteria can live anywhere, and you never know who touched what. So, no need to be a germaphobe, but please be mindful. Encourage your schools and daycare centers to wipe down desks pencil sharpeners, doorknobs, computers, and other high-touch surfaces with bleach-based wipes. Now, this doesn't usually apply to children, but hey, adults get C. diff too, and this one is interesting. Studies also suggest that the majority of people who take the popular class of stomach acid-reducing drugs known as proton pump inhibitors, PPIs, including Asifex, Dexalant, Nexium, Prevacid, Prilosec, Protonix, don't need them. The FDA issued a statement in February of 2012 that the use of these proton pump inhibitors may be linked to an increased risk of C. diff diarrhea. So the FDA advises that patients taking these 
should contact their health care provider and seek care if they take these PPIs and develop diarrhea that doesn't improve. Some other steps for prevention. Clean suspected contaminated surfaces with bleach-based solutions. And for me, that includes the home, too. Avoid people who are known to have C. diff. And remember, hand sanitizers do not kill the C. diff virus, only soap and water. So the ever-present age-old advice, make sure you and your children wash hands thoroughly with soap and water. How long is long enough? Long enough to sing the happy birthday song. In fact, here's one of our most popular Jerry the Germ vignettes. I'm Jerry the Germ, here to spread health care and hospital safety tips all over the airwaves. <laughs> here's our expert, Pat Rulo. Hey, Jerry. I bet you and your germ friends just run and hide whenever you hear the happy birthday song. What do I mean? Oh yeah, people are finding out that the best way to disinfect their hands is to use good old-fashioned soap and water and a lot of friction. And they know that 15 seconds of scrubbing will do the trick. How long is 15 seconds? Long enough to sing or hum the happy birthday song. And long enough to scrub not only the palms, but the tops, sides, in between the fingers, and under the nails. And when folks go to the doctor's office or hospital, they're asking their providers to wash their hands too. Yep, everyone's humming the happy birthday song just to get rid of you. For more patient safety tips, visit speakupandstayalive.com. Sorry, Jerry, but you're going down the drain. Listen to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. For more information, go to speakupandstayalive.com. My mom was a great person, loving, caring. She would do anything for anybody, you know. We had spoken and she said she wasn't feeling well. She was having, you know, very bad diarrhea. As soon as we got to the emergency room, within, I would say, an hour or so, we knew things were not what we thought. They later told us that she had a bacterial infection called Clostridium difficile, which I had never heard of. Certainly several hundred thousand people contract C. diff every year. In terms of deaths, over 25,000 deaths a year. C. diff and C. diff infections are largely preventable. People don't have to die from this, you know? No family needs to go through what we went through. There's absolutely no reason for it. Please join our movement to fight C. diff. Go to PeggyFoundation.org. After the show, be sure to visit the website, speakupandstayalive.com, for more life-saving information. Plus, that's where you can purchase the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, The Patient Advocate, Hospital Survival Guide. Bring the book to the hospital with you. It's the best way to stand out and in a positive way. Purchase the book the patient safety logs, and throw in some of those icebreaker cards. You can order online at speakupandstayalive.com or call me 440-725-5462. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Patient Safety Radio. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo, and today I want to share a special guest or two, but first, let me tell you how I found them. While doing some research on the internet for a completely different topic, I came across a YouTube video posted by a 15-year-old girl that addressed the question, why does everything beep? Her words resonated with me as I experienced all of this hospital beeping during my mom's four-month stay. So her video actually prompted me to do a hospital hazard of the week on alarm fatigue, which aired a few weeks ago. Intrigued by her young yet similar point of view that most patients share about noisy hospital rooms, I looked for more information about her and came across an epic monologue that she posted addressing her irritation with how hospital patients are treated, especially teens. Now, at my last count, that video has over 54,943 views since published on January 22nd of this year. So let's take a listen. So the doctors don't let you sleep at all. Like, if you think you're going to get sleep, then you're crazy. Because they come in at 6 in the morning, and they don't all come together. There's a med student first, most of the time, and then there's another one, and then there's another one. And there are residents, and then there's the actual doctor, who's the actual important one, and then my 
other doctor, my rheumatologist, he comes in at, at noon, like a normal person on his lunch break, and he actually cares about me, so he lets me sleep. Then the other ones are just like, oh, no, I don't care, like, do you need sleep to heal? No, I don't think so. Like, that's crazy. Like, who needs sleep? That's not important. So they come in at whatever time, at 6 in the morning, and I am here, and I, I need sleep. I need to be awake. I need to be happy. And I've tried to tell them that I get I give better answers, and I will talk to you more. I will participate more if I'm not laying in bed like, what did you say to me? Are you talking to me? I'm asleep. I'm sorry. Yeah, so th that's not going to work if you're not getting me engaged and talking to you. And that's how people work together and do things, because they talk. And if they don't talk, then it's bad. It's just, it really annoys me too when they ignore you and they try to talk to your parents. Like, I am 15 years old. I know that's not that old, but I at least I should have some say in what I want being done to me. Like, I am the patient and I need to be heard. Like, I am the patient. It's going to end up happening to me anyway. So if you try to leave the room to protect me from whatever, it doesn't work. I would like to hear what you're about to do to me. If you're about to poke me with a freaking needle, tell me. If you're about to cut off my arm, tell me. I need, I need to know. Well, what started as an innocent video out of frustration ended out as an article in Forbes and much national recognition. I guess it's refreshing to hear our concerns and similar thoughts being voiced with such honesty and freshness. So the voice of those videos is here with us today. She is Morgan Gleason, and her mom, Amy, is also with us. So welcome to the show, Morgan. Thank you for having me. And welcome to you, Mom. Hi, thank you for having us. Oh, it's our pleasure. Well, Morgan, before we dig into your thoughts about your experiences and patient experience, will you briefly share your medical journey with us? Why is it that you know so much about hospital stays? Well, I have a autoimmune disease called juvenile dermatomyositis, and it affects the muscles and the skin, and it makes me very tired a lot, too. So I go into the hospital for monthly treatments of IVIG and Solumedrol. Over the past couple of visits, that's been going on for three years, I've discovered there are many problems in the hospital and healthcare system. You've been in there so often, you've, you've had many, many opportunities to see what's going right and what's going wrong. So what was the tipping point that caused you to voice your thoughts? And did you do so with a plan to post it on YouTube? We didn't actually have a plan to post the video on YouTube, but my mom sent it to an e-patient group that included patient Dave who <laughs> wrote the article on Forbes about it. So she just planned to send that and we never knew it was going to get so much recognition and excitement. But basically, while well, I was in the hospital in January for meningitis, I was not getting enough sleep, like maybe three or four hours a night and over multiple days. So I was very annoyed by that. And I figured, I figured if I was going to make a video, I might as well send it to people and have them and other people like show the support too. So that basically started the whole thing. Yeah, 54,943 views. That's a lot of people, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and why do you think everyone's excited to hear about this? I think it's because so many people have the similar problems and they discovered that there are a lot of flaws in the healthcare system and that patients aren't treated like patients. They're treated like subjects to be tested on instead of actual people with feelings and concerns. Oh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> And Amy, as a mom, what were your thoughts about Morgan's monologue? I thought she just naturally expressed so many of the things that you hear about in healthcare today about patient engagement and trying to make things more patient-centered. And so she just kind of naturally said those things based on her experience, and it seemed like it was something good to share. Mm -hmm. Well, Morgan, you said, I am the patient and I need to be heard. And I was also thrilled to hear you use the word engaged. And I want to talk about that statement as it relates to children and teenagers, because obviously you're not of legal age to make healthcare decisions. So often I would imagine that healthcare providers, and I'm sure some parents, seem to discount and even ignore the wishes and thoughts of a young patient. So share your thoughts about that. I think that people automatically assume that if you're not 18 and you're not allowed to make decisions without a third party, then you don't have any thoughts or feelings about what's happening to you. But that's not true at all. And a lot of times, I think teenagers probably have the most ex most opinions that are about what's going on to them and what's going it's what's going to happen to them, that they need to be heard and that they shouldn't be ignored like they 
don't matter. Right, right. I agree with you, but that's that's kind of a rough one because people do throw that up at you. Well, you know, you're not able to make those decisions and you don't have the experience, but really it's your body. You should at least be able to have some say in it. Yes. If you can't if you can't at least make the final decision, you should at least have some input into it. Absolutely. Unfortunately, you have parents that listen to you. Yes. Yes. Well, now I also saw some rumblings of comments that asked underneath your video that says, well, you know, know, this isn't a vacation spot and you're not the only one here, kind of discounting what it was you were saying. How do you respond to that? Yeah, just because it's expected doesn't mean that it can't change and that the doctors are there to help the patients. It's not the other way around. Not like anybody chooses to have a health problem either. It's just something that happens. So That's right. And and again, I refer back to what you said, that I am the patient and I need to be heard. Yes, I agree. Well, now, this defines what we talk about quite a bit on the show, and that is the patient experience. And wow, it seems like everybody in healthcare is buzzing around, you know, trying to define what the patient experience is when really, I think your statement, I am the patient and I need to be heard, answers that question. But this is for both of you. What is your definition of the patient experience? So I think from watching Morgan go through her experience that she tends to do the best when they frame it around her goals and what she needs. So the hospital where she goes allows her to order food when she likes to order it. So she doesn't just rely on their schedule. So if she is waking up later, then she can order breakfast when she is ready. So that's very patient-centered. Um, obviously, the rounds example that she gives where they come in all at different times and starting very early in the morning is the opposite of that. And um, it's geared around their schedules and not what she needs to get sleep. What do you say, Morgan, about defining the patient experience? Um, I think that the patient experience is unique to everybody. So a lot of things people have said to me, I haven't actually had happen to me directly, but I've heard about it. There's not like a set thing that happens to everybody. Like every hospital is different too. Like how my hospital happens to have like a type of room service thing. So that's nice because if you just have meals sent to you directly without your choice and you don't get to choose what you want, then you're probably not going to eat it. And it's it's just another thing that adds to the most miserable thing. Mm -hmm. And then also I like to have my blood drawn separate from the IV because I personally think that it hurts less than having like the person try to manipulate it in your arm and try to pull out the blood. So I just prefer to have a second stick, but a lot of people think that that's crazy. So I just think that if you can do anything to accommodate the patient, you should try. Right. And and I always find it so absurd that why don't you just ask the patient what would make a good patient experience for them? I mean, instead of everyone trying to run around trying to figure out what the definition might be, well, you nailed it. You said everyone is unique and every patient experience is unique. How about if they just ask the patient? Yeah. If you try to treat everybody as a general thing, then there are going to be some things that other people like that certain people don't. So I think it's just, it needs to be, you need to communicate with the patient and the doctors and decide what you can do to accommodate the patient and their wants and needs. I've even seen with Morgan that um, different ages have different needs or different places where she is in her journey. So when she was first diagnosed and she was three and a half years ago, she was really entertained by certain things that the hospital did for children. But now that she's 15, Mm -hmm. she wants a different kind of thing Mm -hmm. and they don't have as many things for teenagers. Mm -hmm. That's a whole group of folks probably that's missed. Like you say, they um, cater to children and then obviously to adults. And there's there's probably that whole teenage group that gets left out. This could be a new job, Morgan. <laughs> now you talk quite a bit about sleep and noise. And yeah, if you need sleep to heal, and if you're always being awakened in the middle of the night and multiple times throughout the day, it's very difficult. What would be the remedy for that? I think you could just try to be as quiet and respectful of the person's sleep and needs to sleep and rest to get better because it just, it'll make them happier and it'll also speed up their healing process. A lot of my nurses are good at it, but they come in with a flashlight and that's good. They're really good at trying to minimize the light and the noise. I know some nurses, they just flip on the lights and start talking to my mom in the middle of the night while I'm trying to sleep. And that certainly doesn't help. No, it really doesn't help. How are they? How did they react, the folks at your hospital, to your videos? The nurses loved it, but mainly like the risk management people. They tried to tell everybody not to watch it. <laughs> so I think they were mainly concerned with getting bad press in the hospital. And I personally think the hospital is great. And I wasn't trying to say anything, but I was just frustrated. So yeah, Right. And I don't think it's anything particular or unusual to that specific hospital. It happens everywhere. Yes. 
Yeah. Well, now I imagine that your life changes when you have a chronic disease or when someone in your family does. Share with us, both of you, some of the good things that have come from all of this. Um, I think that I have developed more and become more independent. Also, like because I have, I've had to do a lot of things I didn't have to do before. I've gotten a lot more responsibilities to remember to take my medicine and stuff like that. But I also think that I've gotten a lot of opportunities. Like if I had never been in the hospital in the first place, I wouldn't not be here right now. I wouldn't have any of the experiences. And I'd probably just end up being, because I want to go into the healthcare field. So I think that I'd probably just end up being another nurse or doctor with not actually caring about the patient. So I think that's helped a lot. And it's also given me a lot more knowledge on just healthcare and health needs. Sure, sure. You And you are extremely articulate and you're going to go far. That was going to be one of my next questions. Do you think that this experience will lead you into the field of uh, healthcare in some way? And kind of answer that. But did you think that prior to this? Um, I kind of did, but now I'm pretty much certain that I want to definitely do something in the healthcare field. I'm thinking about maybe being a physical therapist. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that's kind of like made sure that I really wanted to. Absolutely. You're going to come at it with such a uh, such a unique perspective and your patients will love you. Yeah. <laughs> well, same question for you, Amy. Sure. I think like any parent and any child or any person that gets diagnosed with something that's serious, it's life altering for sure. In a lot of ways, you know, you face a lot of challenges that other people don't, but it does, like Morgan said, give you some opportunities as well. I think Morgan is a much more compassionate person than probably your average 15 year old. She takes things very seriously and, you know, has ambitions that aren't about going to the mall or what movie's out. Not that she doesn't care about those things, but I think it's raised her level of awareness of the world in ways that are are good. I agree with you, and I'm so impressed and proud to have both of you on the program. I really appreciate your doing that for our listeners. Now, if our listeners want to learn more about you, watch your videos, where can they go to do this? Um, I have a website, morgangleason.com, and then I also have a Twitter, at Morgan underscore Gleason. Your website is what again? Um, MorganGleason.com. MorganGleason.com. May I post that information on my website, Speak Up and Stay Alive as well, so folks that sure. listen can easily cross-check over to you? Yes. Yep. And Amy, you also have a blog? I do. It's amygleason.blogspot.com. Okay. And you've chronicled some of this as it's happening, Yes. Yes, I have. And I've also written some things we've learned along the way of managing chronic disease and how to get the best of your visits and some things like that as well. That's excellent. I think that it's going to be a great resource for people. So am I missing anything? Is there anything you, you two would like to bring up and talk about? The only other thing I would say is I think you touched on the fact that this is really a systemic issue. It's not something that's specific to her hospital or her doctors. She has great doctors and great care and they've, you know, made her better than she was when she was first diagnosed for sure. So I think this is really about our system and how the whole healthcare system works and how schedules are made and how payments are generated and how patients are treated overall. And I do think that we're starting to see a trend of people, at least you hear the words patient experience where you didn't before. When Morgan was first diagnosed, even to now, they have more programs in place at the hospital and trying to give people access to their records and things like that that are coming. So I do think there's a big trend in in the system to move in the right direction. But I think if people will generally just look at it from the patient's view and talk to patients, then they'll find the answers that they're looking for and making a better experience. I agree. And I think the two of you are going to take this quite a long way. I really do. Thank you very much. Well, it's my pleasure. So ladies, any final words of advice for us today and for our listeners? Don't be afraid to speak out, definitely. Don't feel like you need to listen to the doctor all the time. You should definitely listen to the doctor, but don't feel like what they say is set in stone. You should still have an opinion also. Excellent. And especially for teenagers, do you have any specific advice for teenagers? I think that you should be engaged with your health care. And even if nobody will listen to you, to you, you should still try to voice your opinion because somewhere along the way, someone will listen to you. Um, I agree. I think patients getting engaged in their health care, as it's been said, is the blockbuster drug of the century, and I think it will change our health care the way we know it. Great. I love blockbuster drug of the century. I'm going to have to use that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Leonard Kish said that. Well, then I'll borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you both for doing what needs to be done in such an organic and heartfelt way. It's it's people like you who ultimately will make health care safer, better, and a little less noisy. <laughs> So thank you so much, Morgan, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. And thank you, Amy, for all that you are doing as well. Thank you very much.
And with that, let's hear some legal news you can use. Let's spend the next two minutes with our friends at Schraff and King. They always have the answers. David, Francis M. left a voicemail. I signed these documents 10 years ago. Should I complete a new living will or medical power of attorney? Pat, we generally recommend that clients review their estate planning documents every five years. Estate planning documents would include their advanced health care directives, including the living will declaration and health care power of attorney. They will not necessarily have to do new documents. The documents they signed 10 years ago will still be valid and honored, but it's always good advice to review those periodically. And in fact, the language within the standardized forms for those documents has changed a number of times in the last 10 years. So some of those changes perhaps are appropriate for the client to consider by executing new documents. And if our listeners have more questions, Where can they reach you? We can be reached by telephone at 440-585-1600 on our website at www.trafking.com, 440-585-1600. Great advice. Thank you for taking the time to help us today. You're welcome, Pat. Schraff and King in Willoughby Hills, just south of Route 6. Visit them online at schraffking.com. Okay, I'm good to go. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. Now you can join us every Saturday morning in Cleveland, Ohio, or you can listen to us live online from anywhere in the world at the station's websites. We are also on the XDS Cumulus satellite for every other radio station in the country to pick up. So if you love this show, which you should, and you have a friend or a family member in another city or state and would like for them to hear the program, Just tell them to contact their local program director and they can very easily pick up this show and add it to their current lineup. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo. So happy to spend this time with you to help you survive any healthcare or hospital encounter. Well, Eric is back after his birthday break. Woo! Yay, birthday boy. And it is that time again. Uh, I think you boys picked another oldie but goodie out of the game chamber. And that is, are you in jeopardy or are you safe? This is going to be fun. Is Don in the booth? He's ready. Okay, here we go. In five, four, three, two, Q lights, music. Now entering the studio with today's contestants. So let's introduce our players. Who do we have? I'm Bob from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and a former developer and financial planner. Yay, Bobby. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. And... I'm Eric, and I'm a regionally famous radio producer from Northeast Ohio. <laughs> and you're older. A little bit. <laughs> Uh-oh, he reached that milestone of what, 30? 28? Uh... <laughs> Boys never tell. <laughs> he won't tell. <laughs> These people will compete today on... Are you in jeopardy, or are you safe? <laughs> All right, as a reminder, here's how it goes. I will read a health-related statement, and you guys have to decide if you're in jeopardy or if you're safe. Now, remember, you will have limited information to make your decisions, so in a real-life situation, you would ideally have more information in order to make your truly informed decision. Okay? Ready? Go for it. I'm waiting on you. Let's do it. Let's do it. Here is the Speak Up and Stay Alive question number one. You're shopping for a cola beverage. Hmm. Coke or Pepsi? You choose Pepsi. Are you in jeopardy? Or are you safe? That is so, so bad. You're in jeopardy, big time. You're not safe. (laughs) Okay. I would say jeopardy just because it's cola, period. Okay. You know, not the most healthy drink. Absolutely. First of all, yeah, both of them, not healthy drinks, too much sugar. But according to a study published by Consumer Reports, Pepsi products contain dangerously high amounts of, excuse me, MEI, the chemical added to create the lovely caramel color. Yep. Under California's Proposition 65 law, any food or beverage sold in the state that exposes consumers to more than 29 micrograms of MEI per day is supposed to carry a health warning label. Now, in recent consumer report tests, each of the 12 ounce samples of Pepsi One and had more than 29 micrograms per can or bottle. Coke, on the other hand, found negligible amounts, 
therefore making it a smarter choice when it comes to the MEI caramel coloring. And now, Bob, you were thinking about the story we told about the Pepsi using the the aborted fetus cells as a way to enhance the flavors. Oh, yes, I was. And that's exactly what I was talking about. All right. But now we've got the caramel MEI. So what do you think about that, Eric? I think I'll just try to stay away from coldest period. Absolutely. Water is the best alternative, Eric. Yeah. Just drinking chemicals, caramel chemicals. All right, guys. Speak up and stay alive. Question number two. You are in the hospital for a week and seldom get out of bed. You think, ah, what a great time to catch up on my rest. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? Hmm, Eric's pondering that. I'm really just not sure what to think. Okay. What do you I'm going to say you're in jeopardy because I think you need the exercise. You need to move around. You need to get up. And if you don't, all your muscles are just going to relax and you need to get up and move around. You are right. Yes, you've got muscle atrophy, but this this can also help prevent bed sores and blood clots that can form in leg veins. Yeah. So when you're up to it, ask your nurse or a friend or a relative to help you get out of bed and if possible, take a stroll. And if you have to spend a lot of time in bed, ask for special pads that help prevent bed sores and those pneumatic stockings that can help prevent blood clots. And they have mattresses now, too, that move move you around, too, that you can ask for. Yes. Don't think it's you're not there to rest and vacate, huh? That's right. All right. Got it, Eric? Got it. <laughs> move around, man. Okay, the Speak Up and Stay Alive question number three. You are making potatoes for a family party. Several of the potatoes are green. You don't have time to run out to buy another bag, so you use the green potatoes. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? That one, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to say you're probably in jeopardy i don't know why but i've got that there's some kind of a gut feeling (laughs) okay actually that's pretty much the same thing i would say i don't know if i like the idea of green potatoes all right well you're both right because green potatoes contain a poisonous chemical called solanine and it's actually very dangerous for your health it is a fact as potatoes turn green, the concentration of solanine, which is a glycoalkaloid poison, increases, making them poisonous for human consumption. Now, although potato poisoning is rare, it does happen. And there are a few reports of poisoning because of eating green potatoes or drinking potato leaf tea. Oh, that sounds great. Potato leaf tea? <laughs> you guys ever have that? I've had hardly any tea because... <laughs> I don't know. I'm not British. You're not a tea drinker, Eric. <laughs> Did you say you're not British? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the British blend. <laughs> anyway, here's three potato tips. Do not eat potatoes that are spoiled or green below the skin. Potatoes that are not green but have had many sprouts removed are safe to eat. And last, if the taste of a potato is found to be bitter, then it is better not to consume it. No bitter taters. <laughs> right? No bitter taters. No bitter taters, Eric. <laughs> yeah, that's got a nice ring to it. <laughs> no, no bitter. You like that. That's that Southern coming out. Bitter taters. All right. Here is the Speak Up and Stay Alive. Question number four. Every morning upon getting out of bed, you do a series of stretches. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? I'd say you're safe if you do some stretches every morning. You're just trying to get the exercise and getting the blood circulation. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I've, like, uh, had some bad things happening from, like, stretching, like, immediately after waking up. Oh, all right. I think it depends on how you stretch. Stretching in general, though, stretching your body on a daily basis, maybe not in the morning. It's a simple and healthy way to keep your body and your mind active, which improves your lifespan significantly. So if you want to live longer, stretch. This present-day fast culture and busy daily routines have made people's life mechanical. So for a person to be healthy, there should be a healthy balance between mental and physical activities. So when you're stretching, it's important to remember to hold the stretch for 30 seconds. Don't bounce. I think that's where people make an error with uh, stretching. They bounce and remember to breathe. Oh, yeah. Deep breathing. You need to do that. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So if you want to improve your lifespan. Stretch. Got it. Eric stretching. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Bobby, are you stretching? Everyone's stretching. (laughs) Okay, kiddos, here is the uh, speak up and stay alive question number five. Your one-year-old grandchild has a stuffy nose and can't sleep. You rub Vicks VapoRub on the child's chest and under the nose. Is he or she in jeopardy or safe? Gosh, I'm going to say you shouldn't be rubbing anything under a child's nose, so I'm going to say they're in jeopardy. Okay. 
Wait, one year old grandchild? I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah, he has no idea. <laughs> I'll just go along with Bob and say Jeopardy. I was going to say, think back to your youth. Would you want Vicks VapoRub on your, under your no. nose? Okay. Vicks VapoRub is not meant for children and babies under the age of two years old. A, any menthol or camphor-based product like Vicks VapoRub is actually toxic and can be harmful to babies, to their respiratory system. Recent studies have found that putting Vicks VapoRub under a child's nose actually makes it harder for the child to breathe because it, in, it leads to increase in mucus and congestion, especially in children who have narrow airways when compared to adults. So it even says that on the container, not meant for children under two. So, I, I knew I was right. You are right, Bob. So keep it out of kids' reach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thankfully, I still don't have any kids <laughs> to reach for it. <laughs> Well, we don't even know how old you are, so we can't even go there with that, right? (laughs) (laughs) Sure. (laughs) All right, so we learned a few things today. Do you guys remember? Uh, Maybe. The first one was don't drink Pepsi. Got it. All right, we learned about how the caramel color in Pepsi is called MEI and is dangerous to your health. We learned about moving about in the hospital to avoid bed sores, the dangers of green potatoes, the benefits of stretching in the morning or not, and Vicks VapoRub on kids. Wow. Yeah, just sharing all the tips I can. So I ask you on what other patient safety radio show will you find this kind of conglomeration of useful information? What other patient <laughs> safety radio show is there? There's not any. There isn't. And if there is, it surely isn't like this one, right? Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. All right. And folks, don't move an inch because there's so much more you can learn about healthcare and hospital safety on America's favorite and perhaps only patient safety radio show, Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. You got it. Got it, guys. Did good. <laughs> Here's your Speak Up and Stay Alive O oh! moment with Pat Rulo, your healthcare navigation hostess, serving you a generous helping of everything you need to know to help you and your loved ones stay safe during any doctor or hospital visit. I received a phone call from a listener a few weeks ago, and she told me how she was unnecessarily burned by a CAT scan at a freestanding clinic. She received five CAT scans within a short period of time that has left her thyroid compromised despite the fact that she asked the technician for a thyroid shield who refused to give it to her. She called and asked that I look into this and perhaps talk about it on the show. So what exactly is a CT or a CAT scan? Sometimes referred to as computerized axial tomography, CAT, C-A-T. The CT scan is a medical tool for the diagnosis of disease, trauma, or abnormality in patients with signs or symptoms of disease. It's used also for planning and monitoring therapy. What's new and dangerous, though, is that these scans are being marketed as a preventive or a proactive healthcare measure to healthy individuals who have no symptoms of disease. Many of these locations are freestanding facilities that market to health conscious or fearful people, whom I call the worried well, and they use this technology to take a look at people's insides and promise early warnings of cancer, cardiac disease, and other abnormalities. So what's the problem with that? Because the FDA does not regulate how CT scanners are used or set dose limits, different centers end up using an array of radiation doses, some of which seem unnecessarily high. Couple that with the fact that many people receive unnecessary CT scans and along with them, unneeded doses of radiation. According to findings published in JAMA Internal Medicine, one third of people getting a CT scan did not know that the test exposed their body to radiation. More people reported having thought about when they could eat or whether their parking would be validated after the test than about the effects of radiation. And then we have some unscrupulous practices that pay for their machines and pay themselves high wages with these money-making scans. On the other side, physicians do walk a fine line between too much care and too little care. There certainly is an atmosphere of paranoia that exists. Let's order the scan just to be sure. Be sure of what? that you don't get sued for not ordering the scan? Malpractice concerns are a driver of unnecessary scans. I'm sure of that. By now, we know that radiation is all around us, 
And it's the cumulative effect we need to concern ourselves about. Americans today are exposed to seven times more radiation from diagnostic medical imaging tests than they were 30 years ago, thanks to the overuse of x-rays, CT scans, and mammograms. And CT scans are the biggest culprits, delivering as much as 500 times the radiation of a standard x-ray. So the question is, how much radiation is too much? Well, one CT abdomen scan equals 234 chest x-rays. If you have a single full-body CT scan in your life, your risks are very minimal. Maybe one out of 1,200 would die of radiation-induced cancer. However, if you're doing this type of screening on a regular basis, then the radiation doses add up and the risks become quite high. The radiation dose of one full body CT scan is close to the doses received by Japanese survivors of atomic bombs. And each successive CT scan adds up to more exposure. And here's something I never gave any thought to. CT scanners are designed for people of an average build and an average weight. When obese patients require a CT scan, the additional layers of body fat will produce blurry images if the scanner's regular settings are used. Technicians typically address this problem by turning up the power of the scanner. Unfortunately, doing so results in overweight patients receiving higher than normal doses of radiation. That's kind of scary. And according to research, obese men's internal organs receive an average of 62% more radiation than those of average weight men during a typical CT scan. And for women, the figure is 59%. In either case, although the increased exposure might not amount to much for just one session, it could definitely add up over the course of multiple scans. And then, what about these type of scans for children? In a study published in June 2013 in JAMA Pediatrics, it was found that children exposed to radiation from CT scans potentially had double the risk of developing cancer later in life, as well as an increased risk of leukemia. So what questions should we be asking, since many times our providers do not discuss the radiation risks with us? Well, first, ask why the CAT scan is necessary and what the doctor hopes to learn that can't be learned via another diagnostic source. Ask, how will having this exam improve my care? Then ask, are there equally good alternatives, such as ultrasound or MRI? They don't emit radiation. Also, if you need a CT scan and you weigh less than 180 pounds, your doctor may be able to decrease the radiation dose. Then I would check out the clinic or hospital ratings by the American College of Radiology. I would also ask my provider about the technician's training. According to a talk on May 10, 2013, at the Virtual Symposium on Radiation Safety and Computed Tomography, they said, quote, Right now, there are only four known CT programs in the country where somebody could go and take a CT course and get the clinical competencies. 95% of CT techs who are performing CAT scans get their training on the job, unquote. And I say, I wouldn't want an on-the-job trainee zapping me without adequate training and experience. Also, be sure to request a shield to protect your breasts, reproductive organs, and thyroid. Wear a thyroid guard and lead apron during dental x-rays. Recent research suggests that repeated exposure may be linked to thyroid cancer if patients aren't properly protected. And you can also ask whether you can receive a digital x-ray which uses less radiation. And here's one, if you're pregnant, just say no. And ask even more questions, especially if it's your child prepared to get a CAT scan. Also, keep a record of your CT scans. Give a copy to your doctor and get a digital version of your completed scan to give to other physicians so you don't have to repeat the scan. And ask your doctor, can you use the older test result? Let your doctor know if you've received any imaging at another office or hospital within the past maybe five years. He or she may be able to re-examine the results and spare you another round of radiation. And lastly, be wary of freestanding clinics that offer virtual full body scan checkups as a strictly preventative measure. From a website of specialists who tout the virtual checkup, the full body scan delivers not much more radiation than your total annual radiation exposure from natural causes." Unquote. And I say their scan delivers not much more radiation than your total annual radiation exposure from natural causes. This says nothing. What does not much more radiation mean? And in a millisecond, I will receive more than an entire year's worth of radiation? 
Uh, I'm not going there. Oh, but they also have gift certificates and corporate outings. Bottom line, folks, CAT scans are definitely important diagnostic tools given the proper set of circumstances. I'm not saying do not have a CAT scan. I am saying be sure you know why you are getting one. Ask the right questions. And please, if you're looking to send me a gift, don't send a gift certificate for a virtual full body scan. You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. I am Pat Rouleau, your hostess and author of the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, the Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide, available at all of our live speaking events or at our website, speakupandstayalive.com. And I want to remind you, if you're looking for a speaker for your next event, I'm happy to share my expertise with your group. My presentations are always fun, fast-paced, and full of information you will not find anywhere. So call me. And let's talk about how we can make your next event a memorable and worthwhile experience. I'm at 440-725-5462, or you can always email speak at speakupandstayalive.com. Now we're short on time today, and be sure to come back next week. Lots more to share with you. So tell your friends, mark your calendars, and set your alarms for next week. Same time, same place, but not the same information. Start your week with an O. Speak up and stay alive. Patient Safety Radio. And until next week, I hope you have a healthy and a happy week. I am Pat Rulo, and I am your guide to safe and successful healthcare and hospital encounters. The information provided in today's broadcast is for informational purposes only and was not intended for use as diagnosis or treatment of a health problem and should not be considered as medical advice. If you've missed part of today's show or just want to share the information with friends, you can listen to all of Pat's previous shows at speakupandstayalive.com. Want even more information? Purchase a copy of Pat's book at speakupandstayalive.com or you can call Pat at 440-725-5462. Until next week, remember, it's okay to ask others to wash their hands. You have to speak up and stay alive.